Giovanni Sergio and the organizing committee of the conference here to let me have this opportunity to kick off the, the MIC-3 event. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about the seven C's of creativity and illustrate each C with a little bit of work done by uh, myself and collaborators uh, in our research group, uh, okay, which I was directing during several years and now I'm uh, having a little more time to work on other things to do because we have a new evolved lab with a little bit uh, with our new director. So um, first of all, this slide, because I don't have all day with you, I have to cover approximately two million years of history in this slide to bring us up to the 21st century. So I start out with my first point, minus two million years, Homo habilis, our ancestor, is creating hunting tools, innovating, thinking creatively how to kill animals better, quicker, and bigger animals. And that's our first evidence of this capacity to engage novel thinking that has an adaptive value. Fast forward to the 21st century. We have several surveys like the IBM survey of CEOs who say that creativity is a top thing for their future uh, head management. Um, 2013 Adobe survey of teachers and parents in USA, UK, Germany, Australia, in which they massively endorse the importance of creativity in the educational system and it should be more developed. OECD being interested in creativity and educating it with a study in around 15 member countries, uh, show, trying to see if teachers can arrive to boost creativity when they try in their pupils. Uh, World Economic Forum cites creativity as one of the top three characteristics important for employability in the next 20 years. And as you may be aware, PISA 2021 will include creativity as the complementary domain. And OECD is now looking at creativity in higher education in a new project. So all of this suggests that 21st century, 21st century skills, they include creativity. Now, as you're here and you signed up and many of you are in Geneva and you're all working on creativity, I imagine you know what we're talking about. But I put this up just in case so we have a shared understanding. The definition uh, in phase with the way I see it for this half an hour. Okay, and so um, it's an ability to generate new productions that are meaningful in their context. And you can be creative in all kinds of domains professional domains or personal life uh, at your home, for example, even being creative as a person creating who you are is a creative act also. Sometimes in a professional domain, you, get, you do something really outstanding like Marconi and you get recognized worldwide for what you've done, you become eminent. And innovation is related uh, with creativity. So if creativity is sort of getting the idea, then you can develop the idea. Often it's not the same people. And then you can bring the idea to market and have the idea adopted. And often that's even other people who are involved. So creativity, innovation, very related. Now let's get to the map of creativity, the conceptual map. And you may be aware of the seven seas, historically, referring to the seven bodies of water, which are reflected uh, in parallel with the seven celestial spheres, and that represents the universe of all things, or the whole world, if you like. And if you've traveled the seven seas, you've traveled the whole world. So since creativity starts with a sea, coincidentally, um, I'm suggesting the seven C's of creativity, and here's what they are. Creator, the creative person. What are the characteristics of these creative people? You could study that. Creating the process, you could study how does it unfold. Collaboration, when you create, you may interact with others. Maybe you're in a team, for example. Or maybe you're interacting with your family or your friends who are, in a way, giving you feedback. Um, context, 
is your surrounding environment. Creator, we can study its characteristics, how it supports or hinders creativity. Creation is what you create. It's the products. What are their characteristics? How do we judge that? What, is it, what does it mean to say something's a creative production? Consumption is the uptake of these creative ideas in the world by other people who adopt these ideas. And curricula is all that's got to do with training, developing creativity, uh, often through education. Okay. So. This is just a, a summary of what I said, and I'd like to note that all the work that I'm going to present today uh, is often collaborative work done with our uh, permanent colleagues. These are the actual permanent colleagues in our lab group. There are others who are collaborating too who are not permanent colleagues, and so there are many people who uh, we work with on the work that's presented today. Okay. So let's talk about the first C quickly, the creators. Who are these people? Well, we've developed over the years the multivariate approach to creativity that suggests that there's different resources or ingredients that are important to have this creative capacity. Some of them are cognitive abilities, like mental flexibility. Some of them are personality traits, like risk-taking traits. Some are maybe emotional characteristics like idiosyncratic uh, feelings as you live your life. Uh, and some are environmental resources if you're in a context that's stimulating. If you're living in the Marconi house with the hills and all, maybe you've got a good environment to send communication waves out far and see what happens to them. And if you're in the city of Boulogne, when you send a wave, it hits a building, so it doesn't go very far. Okay. Um, now, all of these ingredients combine to yield what we can call creative potential. This potential might be expressed or not. It may remain latent or it may become manifest as you engage in the process of creating. And you yield productions which can be appreciated for their novel value. Okay. Well, we could study great cases using this kind of model. What is it that led Van Gogh to become a great painter? We can look into the ingredients in a historical case study, for example. And we do try this kind of thing. And for example, you would find that he was very excited about Jean-Francois Millet's work to the extent that a great number of his paintings are largely inspired from Millet's work. Uh, but he added his own personal touch well, in the artistic process. Uh, now, you might recognize Martin Cooper, who at MIC-1 got the Marconi Prize, which is the big thing to get in the field. And we do try this kind of right. He invented that thing you have in your pocket that you might have put on no ring mode. Okay? And um, there he is with the first working telephone. Uh, as he said, it, there was no battery life problem because since it weighed more than two uh, kilograms, a call of 20 minutes was largely enough for the whole day, and then he could recharge. Um, uh, and we did interview him, and he explained how he got the key idea behind the telephone, uh, mobile phone. Essentially, it wasn't completely a random thing because, you see, he was a walkie-talkie guy. He was deploying walkie-talkie systems. And he realized from feedback of users that they, you know, they might like to have this kind of connectivity. And in order to make the walkie-talkie a cheaper product for Motorola, they decided to remove the ability to talk so you could only listen. And to make it even cheaper, they decided to remove the ability to listen to what the person said. This made a very cheap walkie-talkie because you couldn't talk and you couldn't listen. You could only beep you. And then you can go to a phone, find a phone and make a call, say, what do you want? Anyway, that was the beginning. That was the first small step towards our modern telephones. And the story goes on. Anyway, so he had this insight. He had detected something, uh, a new need that was not manifest in the environment. Okay, we have developed a creative profiler tool. 
in which we try to measure these ingredients with various tests and questionnaires, and we see a person's profile, like in green, compared to a reference profile of people who are being creative in some job or task. And we can estimate your potential to be creative in some job or some task or some other job or some other task. Um, now, we also, in terms of the creators, work on children and adolescents and young adults. And we've been working together with Maud Besançon and Baptiste Barbeau to uh, develop uh, EPUC, Evaluation of Potential Creativity, over the years, active, very actively since 2000. And so we've got artistic, graphic, verbal, literary domains, and then we have it in various languages now and we have it in the social math science domain, so we conceive creativity as a kind of a domain-specified ability, more than a domain-general ability. And it was used in the OECD study as a pre-test, post-test, to see if teachers arrived to train creativity. Okay, now here's an example of what ki uh, one kid did when we gave them the banana. This kid made 10 drawings. Is 10 drawings good? Well, if you're a kid around nine years old in France, it's pretty normal to do about 10 drawings, okay? So we have norms, and we say this kid has an average potential. It's not a spontaneous act for them to make drawings of bananas, okay? So we're testing their potential. We're saying, how high can you jump, for example? Here's an example of what one kid did. And we measure fluency, because that is the driving motor for us of divergent mode. Now, we also have what we call convergent integrative mode, creative synthesis. And we give them a set of objects. In the first drawing of the room, you see, essentially, the objects we give. And they put them in a little bedroom scene. They made one drawing. They integrated our objects. It's kind of a typical idea, getting a kind of lowish score because the integration is not so original and not so great because in this bedroom there's a carrot hanging on the floor, for example. Now, um, we also have kids who made a fishing scene with the, the, the mannequin saying, I'm gonna catch a fish. Well, the objects suggest this kind of scene. It's more integrative, but it's, again, not extremely original. And here you see some more highly original integrations of the same objects where we have objects being used in non-typical ways, so you have the rabbit there with light bulb as feet and a valise as the body. You have what one child called the samurai warrior with the fish as his head, and his sword is made of a carrot and the mannequin, uh, etc. His body's made mostly of the light bulb. So these are highly integrated and highly original, showing a capacity for creative synthesis. Where we have and we can situate a kid compared to other kids on these different components of creative potential, like an IQ test. So we use the same reference points. 100 is a normal person and 15 points standard deviation. Now, this has been studied in various contexts, cultures. For example, when we do a structural analysis of the tasks, we do find the expected structure by domain with divergence and convergence abilities per domain. In China, in, in Hong Kong, we also find the same structure. And most recently in Slovenia, the same structure was found, if you were in Geneva, that was mentioned. And uh, you see another structural model on the upper right, which is the Wallach and Kogan test, which was also given in Hong Kong. It turns out that the structure of the Wallach and Kogan test differs from culture to culture, uh, whereas the EPUC model seems to have a, a, a similar structure across these cultures. Okay? That's partly because Wallach and Kogan's so-called graphic is actually kind of verbal in nature, for example. Okay. Uh, now let's go to another C, creating the process. And here I'd like to talk about a project we did over many years. Uh, in particular, Marion Botilla is here, and she was very involved in this project. Uh, and um, uh, so here we have an example of art students at the university making sculptures in the course of their regular study. 
And over the weeks, they keep a notebook, they check off their activities, we try to trace their activity, and they end up to make a sculpture that the art teachers will judge as more or less creative in the end. And so, the more creative artists, we can trace their uh, flow diagram of different states of work. For example, define your problem, uh, get documentation about the topic you're trying to sculpt, what do other sculptors do, uh, experiment, which means try stuff with the clay in the studio. And so there's flowed a flow between these uh, micro activities that compose the process itself. And if you look at the more creative artists, their flow chart looks different from the less creative visually. That means it's like going from point A to point B. There's many routes and some of them are better than others to get you to an original solution. Okay, so again, here we see individual differences in the process itself lead to outcomes that are more or less original and creative. Same kind of study done in engineering students who had to invent a kitchen for a camping car uh, that had a lot of special properties so you can boil eggs at at the top of Mount Everest and all kinds of things so in your again, camping car. Here and um, here the, the presentation is a little different, but what you see is the first five sessions of work and the second five sessions over 10 sessions of the semester. And you see different activities, for example, uh, evaluating your ideas, for example, and the blue are the students who will end up to be giving not so creative ideas after the 10 sessions. And the green are the ones who end up to be the more creative at the end. So at the end, we find out who is who, and we can see to what extent they use certain activities more or less. Process differences relating to individual differences in the outcome. In terms of collaboration, I have an example of a study in which uh, it was an interview study with experts who design transportation in the Parisian area. They design how the metro will work and bus systems or new transportation uh, lines. And they collaborate with users who they bring in to talk with in focus groups sometimes. And so we use critical incident technique to interview these experts who tell us about how the collaboration went in different cases when they had users with them. And through their descriptions, we are able to model the collaborative process and, for example, to find out that in some times users are reacting to a prototype and sometimes they're just reacting to a vague idea, for example. And sometimes they are um, talking about services that could be proposed in the transportation system. And sometimes they are uh, supposed to project in the future what will transportation be in the next 20 years, this kind of thing. And it shows that the quality of the collaboration varies according to certain parameters I cited. And so we can decompose collaboration cases into those that are more successful, less successful, based on the parameters of the way the collaboration is structured. Again, these are individual difference data that we're trying to use to model collaboration. Now, a few words about another C, context. Okay, so uh, in terms of context, um, we could work in the real environment. We could do surveys, and we do sometimes, of characteristics of work environments, for example, and where you work, are there windows, do you have a view of nature, things like that, okay? Uh, when you get to work, do you pass by a mausoleum as you come up the hill to the building, for example, okay? Uh, and, um, however, we also found it interesting to work in virtual environments, 
which are a way to model the real world, see if things could work. And also they're a way to eventually in the future, stay at home and work on distance in a uh, location through internet. So maybe some of you know about Second Life, it's a virtual world, maybe some of you have avatars, and if you were here at MIC2, I talked about it. And so I'd like to show you some new results. So that if you were here at MIC2, this is the new, newest, freshest thing. Um, and so yes, our lab has a small island in this world in which we've constructed rooms. And you come in, now you could go to the dance floor, but that's the public domain. When you come to our island, you enter through a force field, and then you are in one of our rooms as an avatar. Now, in this particular study, we have a control condition, which is real people in a real room in our lab. And they are collaborating, three people are collaborating, and they don't actually have blindfolds in black on their eyes in the real situation. Uh, and um, there is an experimenter there in red who is going to give instructions and monitor the group progress. In the virtual condition, three people are in separate little rooms and they end up in the meeting room and there's the uh, same um, head of the meeting who is there. And they will generate ideas in both cases to uh, improve transportation uh, and, uh, in the Parisian uh, area. And so we had 60 participants in this particular study, and they did brainstorming in the real room or the virtual room. Okay. And they all have neutral avatars, and sometimes we give them a creative looking avatar and that can boost them also. And they're all in a neutral environment, the meeting room. If we put them in a creative stimulating environment, that can boost them also. In this particular study, they're just collaborating and generating ideas. It turns out that the average number of ideas generated is higher in the virtual room than in the real room, first of all. So when you get people out of their normal environment, even if it's seemingly like their normal environment, they get more ideas. And the average originality of ideas is higher in the virtual space, and the utility of ideas is the same. So the virtual space has some positive environmental effects in general, we've found. Uh, and these can be even enhanced to some extent. Now, all of these people completed the creative profiler, by the way. So we have their personal profile. And what you can find is that in the ideas that are generated by these people, there's different kinds of ideas. But the type E idea, which is actually, as you see on the left, not such a common number of ideas, the type E are the most original ideas. Those are ideas that are uh, out of this world ideas, like on different planet ideas, okay, science fiction. So if you generate science fiction ideas, it's not so common to do it, and those tend to be the highly original ideas among all the ideas generated. What you can find is that, first of all, risk-taking people who have a personality trait that they're a risk-taker should be favored for being creative in general. Well, if you compare here in blue, the high risk takers and the low risk takers, the low risk taking people, if they're in a real environment or a virtual environment, they're not producing that many ideas. There's no real effect to change environment. But the high risk takers in the real environment, they're acting like the low risk takers. There's maybe social pressure there, okay? But when they are in their avatar, they're really producing a lot of ideas. The number of ideas is highly related in this study to the originality of ideas. So we have here a facilitative effect in particular for certain people who have this high risk-taking characteristic which might not show itself in a normal social environment. So this is an interactive individual difference coming into play with the virtual condition. Uh, in particular, that study was done with Samira Bourgeois and Jean-Marie Burkhardt, and it's coming out 
in the Creativity Research Journal soon, in a special issue by Vlad. Okay, as the world is a small, yes. Okay, now let's talk about creations, the productions. I'd like to tell you about a study in which uh, participants assessed the creativity of ads about cars. So here you have two of the ads, but there were many ads, real ads. This, this ad here, you see one ad that's a kind of typical ad. It's functional, but it's uh, not highly original. You just got information about a car. In the other ad, it's actually quite original. We don't know to what extent it's functional, but it, you see there is an L, there's a mammoth who's meeting a kind of a tank on the cave wall in Lascaux, and this is an ad for Citroën. I'm not sure why, but anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a highly unusual ad. And so they had to judge the creativity of these ads that differ by nature on originality and appropriateness as already predetermined by another panel of judges. Now these people, these judges, are going to take a divergent thinking test also. What you're going to find is that the judges in blue are those judges who themselves produce a lot of ideas on a divergent thinking test of unusual uses. The judges in red are those who don't produce too many ideas on the divergent thinking test, but they're all judges. And so what you can see is that when the advertisement has a high, sorry, said large, high level of originality as determined by a previous panel, the highly creative, the high divergent thinkers are giving it a higher score compared to the lower divergent thinkers. So they are, for us, better catching the originality. Okay? And at a middle level of originality, they're both giving the same scores. And at a low level, they are giving a lower score than the uh, weak divergent thinkers for the things that are not very original as predetermined. In other words, the highly original, high, the high divergent thinkers are a better judge of what's original and what's banal. Okay? Okay. And consumption. Now, in terms of consumption, uh, this is the uptake of creative goods. Here's a study that was done in collaboration with uh, people from economics, including Louis Levy Garbois, and uh, uh, young people in the middle school near Paris. They were asked to tell us what kind of music they like to listen to typically. And so they tend to say rap, R&B, and pop rock. And they tend to say they don't listen to jazz, blues, and classical. Okay. And we also measure with EPUC their divergent and convergent integrative capacity, which is either lowish or highish. Strong divergence, strong integrative, or weak divergence, weak integrative. What you see is that these, these students are going to listen to clips of music. In particular, they're going to listen to clips of music that are either known to them or new to them. So they're going to uh, be consuming and getting satisfied, more or less, by this listening experience. Now, when they listen to the darker purple, this is music that they know already. It's in the genre that they like already. And you'll see that uh, out of a 10-point scale, they give a four or five, approximately a five, to say how much they like the listening experience. When you go to the light purple, it's music that's out of their genre. So in other words, it's typically jazz, blues, and classical, which they never listen to, generally speaking. So it's a new thing for them. And they like it less, in general. They get less satisfaction from listening to it. It's new to them. But those who get the more satisfaction are those who are higher on integrative creative capacity, who are the ones who are producing in a test more creative integrative works. So the more creative people are enjoying the exposure to this more novel music 
albeit they not all liking that music as much as the regular music they listen to. So there is a consumption bias that those who are more creative are attracted or get more satisfaction from the newer stuff that's out there in the marketplace to be consumed, let's say. And now last uh, C, curricula, pedagogical interventions. This is data from a study done in Thailand where there was a pre-test and a post-test. And the pre is in blue, the post is in orange. And you see experimental classrooms and control classrooms. They all had divergent and convergent integrative epoch tasks. This is in the graphic domain, for example. And you can see that the control pre-post, they slightly go up, but not really change on divergent. But those who had teachers trying to be creative with students, the students show a boost in post-test. Same thing for integrative convergent, but the differential boost is not very um, marked between the, the control classroom and the experimental. So in divergence, the boost was the most notable. I'd like to mention an individual difference parameter in this context, which is that this is the summary of many classroom teachers who were experimental or control. If we zoom on the experimental teachers, we're going to look at the set of seven classroom teachers from various schools, teacher A through G, different class sizes a little, but around 30 to 35 students in a typical class. And you'll see the pre-test and the post-test for each teacher. And you'll see it graphically in the figure there, some teachers show a greater boost than others, you see. And so some are more able to deploy the creativity techniques than others. They're all experimental teachers. And so there's an individual difference in the capacity of the teacher to implement the creative activities. So again, the environment, but the environment is not just in school we gave activities. It's also teacher dependent. The classroom dependency. Okay, so now this is to bring us to conclusion, and maybe there's a few questions. And since this is MIC 3, I decided to have three concluding statements. Um, first of all, as you saw, this talk is organized around the conceptual roadmap of creativity based on the seven C's as a organizing topic. Um, so if you look into research on creativity, you can probably even think of yourself, are you working on one C or another more or less? Then um, we highlighted the individual differences approach. Each example was individual difference-based research, because that's our main angle, in fact, in the kind of work that colleagues and myself are doing. And um, as you see, some of the results are interface between individual differences of the creator type people and, for example, the environment, for example. So the virtual environment works better boosts some people more than for others, for example. So this is two C's interfacing between creator and context, for example. And I think those are particularly fruitful angles to look at at the interface phenomenon. And so thank you all for your attention. Okay, so time for questions. Uh, please uh, use the microphone so the people in remote uh, can follow you and uh, say your name when you ask a question. Who wants to ask a question? No question, so wait. Wait for it. Tim. Hi, Todd. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I just have a Say question for you. For oh, Tim Patston from Australia. Um, Todd, with the teachers, you showed quite a big difference between the effect of each teacher could have upon the class. 
Did you measure anything about the teachers that might have accounted for that difference? Were they more or less experienced? Was there a gender difference? Did they teach particular subjects? Did you measure the teachers for their own creative self-concept? I'm just wondering if you thought there was anything in what made a difference? What was different about the teachers that had the different results? That's a good question, and indeed there is data about all these characteristics about these teachers. So we could try to look at those who were the more performing, the less performing, what's their nature specifically. We also have the activity traces of what they decide to do with their classroom. So it's a way to go even further in a pedagogical intervention is to take this teacher variability into account. Hi, Patricia Elton, North Central University, California. Um, I have a question. When you say environment for your measurements, did you include climate or that kind of response between the teachers in the environment, or you was it just the environment as in the setting of the creativity classroom? Um, because you, we're, I'm seeing literature starting to separate in that area. Mm. Well, if you're referring to the teacher training study, the teacher study at the end, uh, that was a study where teachers tried to deploy creative activities in their classroom as they decided they wanted to do, more or less. And so there were some indices collected about the school environment in general, but uh, in terms of environmental questionnaires, class climate questionnaires and all that, that kind of stuff we tend to put more under the context seat. And it's in line with the other studies that are about real life context in business and in school settings in which characteristics of the physical and social climate might boost or help or hinder creative performance. And there's quite a few studies like that. So you put it under context and we can start breaking out domains in that. Yeah. Got it. So, I was asking, I'm Bem Lahunt from University of Technology, Sydney. I'm interested in, well, we're spending like half a billion dollars, with, uh, $2 billion on new spaces to create more creative environments and collaborative environments for learning and teaching. I'm wondering if you actually had any interface with real environments to get some insight into what that looks like and what, so, what so best case looks I'm like. Ben I'm ben from, okay, from well, uh, there are people studying real physical environments that can be designed, and we consider that the virtual space is a place to test a design that before implementing in the real world. For example, our studies suggest that the way people act in this virtual space is the way they act in the real space, that it's a very analogous situation and a good model. However, we also think that the virtual space is a new extra space in which people can work. So it has its own properties. Some of those properties cannot even be replicated in first life, as we call it like we're here today, first life. Uh, so for example, avatars by nature can fly, whereas we have trouble to fly, except if you get in a plane, okay? But it's for them natural to just stand up and fly. So they can fly on coffee break to a beach and play volleyball and fly back to the conference room and sit down and listen, for example, of course naturally okay and so also you know you can have a second uh, you can have a virtual space room for example uh in the bottom of the ocean for today's class and on the moon for tomorrow's class and this is technically rather difficult in the real world okay thank you very much please join me in giving again hand again to todd